Well, it's hard to believe, but you are on Essay 5, and you've been through the process of selecting your articles, you've submitted an outline, and you have summarized the two required database articles. And you need to check uh, Blackboard for my feedback on that, but also as you are shifting to the drafting part, which includes citing your sources, um, we need to stop and just make sure that you understand what you need to do. Now some of you, if, especially I know if you took me for one-on-one, -on -one, you have been through a uh, research paper and instruction on citation, uh, but doing one with literature, you know, it can be, it's a little, another dimension to it, it's a little trickier, and if you've never done one at all, then you need to really carefully look at the examples, you need to look at all the videos carefully, um, and make sure you are f following the instructions exactly. Okay, so we're doing what would be considered an exploratory research essay because you are exploring them to find out more information about stories that we have already studied. And the key thing that I'm looking for is that you are building on the knowledge that you gain from a study. We've already learned some of the basic things. Uh, we've done our own literature analysis. We've had focus uh, on times on theme or on conflict or character. Um, identifying with a character. Now we're getting outside of what we've learned how to do and expanding that. We're expanding that by seeing what literature scholars who devote their their profession, their life to studying uh, these works or these authors <clears throat> and insight that they can give us because they've had more time and more training, right? And we need to make sure we are getting scholars and experts and that's why I've required you to use the library databases. Now they're AVL, which means um, as we had a little issue with our getting into the databases on the website the other week, you can get into them through the Alabama Virtual Library. But either way, these are uh, paid for by tax dollars, for the AVL, and tuition dollars because we do have special ones in the Lawson State website that you can't get from the AVL. And these would not be, they're not free. Uh, you've paid for them these other means and uh, the stuff out there is not free on out on the web. Internet sources are generally, you know, if they're like Wikipedia, SparkNotes, they're just not generally accepted sources. Wikipedia, you can't verify the expertise of the authorship. SparkNotes is kind of high school level. This is a college paper. And so we expect college level scholarly, academic, uh, knowledgeable sources. Okay. And of course, I've I uh, hope that this would already been checked off, uh, that you have, you're have you writing about a topic or story you didn't already write about for a previous essay because that will be caught by SafeAssign, it'll catch any matching content, and then you're going to be in really big trouble. So make sure you've made that shift if that was needed. Um, you can use uh, additional sources as long as they are scholarly, that uh, they've been published in a scholarly or academic um, you know, pay, uh, journal, that kind of thing. You can get them. You can get a third or fourth if you need it to get to your length. Okay, but basically you should be able to handle this with just the two. You can. You need to have a focus that unifies your paper. So it could be theme. It could be character analysis, symbols, any of those things. Those are just examples. Of course, it depends on what you actually find. It's kind of wide open out on you know in the databases what scholars are going to focus on that they think will take us beyond what um, is pretty obvious on our own study. There are um, examples in your book, chapter 6, that's part of your reading um, assignment, where you can see a research supported essay, there's explanation of things, there's additional information on documenting and citing sources, chapter 7. Now, that's super important, and I'll look at the, an example with you, because if you don't document and cite your sources, then you've plagiarized. But there is also accuracy in citation, you've got to do it a particular way, and that's part of um, college protocol. It's going to be part of your professional protocol. No, it won't be in your profession to use MLA, but there will be a set protocol that you will have to follow um, on your job. And so you just kind of have to get used to that. You can't just do it whatever seems, you know, good to you. We've already discussed our prompts. You're at the point where you have done that. Matter of fact, you have uh, done number one, number two, number three, and now we're coming up to number four. And that first draft has to have the in-text parenthetical citations and a works cited page. Because I can't tell if you're doing your citations right without it. So if you don't have that, you will not get a passing grade. And our drafts are always 500 words. Now that's for the words in the essay. The uh, works cited page 
it was a separate you know it's part of it but it's not part of the essay like the five paragraphs okay so that doesn't count in the 500 words it doesn't count in the 750 to 1000 words either so when you get to this you might have a hundred you know 1050 or a 750 word you know draft and then you add the work cited that could be another hundred or 130 you know because you're gonna end up with three citations by the way we'll come back to that I've looked at your outlines you need to kind of look at my feedback but uh, to make sure your introduction is doing what it's supposed to okay it does need an engaging lead-in that leads us to the focus of your paper you do need to identify the short story and the author that you selected for this focus a little bit of background but not a summary of the story I already know the story I don't need to be told the story we don't generally write that way in college um, it's not a book report background time period of the story the publication date and then anything that would be relevant um, background context that we need to know before we understand the focus of your paper okay now remember we all read the story but you just need to make sure we're on the same page with you and then it needs to end with a thesis that states the specific research focus of the essay and previews the arrangement basically the main points and um, if it is focused on the articles you know then as an exploratory research paper you can include those titles there that information um, the body paragraphs do however need to begin with a clear topic sentence stating the focus of the paragraph followed by explanation and supported by primarily database articles now again it depends on your outline option if you took the one where you take the summary uh, you know article approach then you have that third paragraph which should be the first one that highlights um, you know what you found on your own analysis on that story on a related focus like if your articles are focusing on symbolism then what you were able to see with symbolism and you would need to use the text the story as your quoted and supported material now the emphasis at this point is to be paraphrased or summarized okay that's why you did the article summaries however a lot of the summaries I read are very very vague and ov overviewed and you need what you need to do is add some specifics now that can be a quote and I even put that in some feedback you know quote the really good stuff paraphrase the rest but the key ideas that are unique to that article are what you did this research for okay so insert that in along the way now I'm saying limiting the direct quoting to one quotation per paragraph no longer than two lines I will allow as you'll see in the sample I give you that if you are very selective in your quotation and you integrate it well into your paraphrasing and summarizing you can have uh, more than just one quotation you might have two short ones okay but the thing we're trying to do is not have just a copy paste paper that's not really uh, a research paper the way that you're supposed to present it you have to be very selective about what you quote word for word uh, the rest of it has to be paraphrased or, or summarized but you still let us know that you always are attributing it doesn't matter if you borrow that information from that article it has to be very clear that it came from that source and uh, and what page number it came from whether you summarized it paraphrased it or directly quoted it the thing that you do to help remind us of that the borrowed information is that thing called attribution uh, it's where you identify the source by name you know you have to put it at least here but um, when you tell us a little bit more about it in the sentence that's another way according to literary scholar Hannah McKnight the story blah 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 and you found that on page two and then you say something else like she also notes that or the article indicates that something that reminds us that you got this from an outside source and it's separate from the things that you observed on your own then your conclusion wraps up a reflective insight that's gained from this research that you did uh, and any thoughts relevant to the essays focus you should have learned something new right and that should have given you some insight here's the, the citations you have a work cited page and in the past we've only had one citation because we had one story except for the comparison contrast that's right we had two because we had two stories now we have one story and two database articles uh, so that's a total of three and they need to be alphabetized let's take a look at a sample okay this is written on a, a story that we did not study this time so it makes a great um, example because no one is working on this so it's called had a little catchy title called ghost story 
and because that's the emphasis of the articles. All right, I've highlighted some things. First of all, we see that it tells us what story, gives us that background information. I wouldn't call it a super engaging lead-in, but it does the job of giving us just the background and just an overview of the story. It tells about when it was first published and that he approached it in a very unusual manner, and it is an unusual story. And it, they start leaning, uh, shifting the focus to the format being what's called non-linear. And it might be helpful to explain that, but, um, and then that it's also seen as a ghost story because of this mythical narrator. So it's on point of view, narrating. Maybe he's refer to referring that or indicating that the narrator is a ghost. Hmm. Here's the thesis. Through the use of nonlinear structure, that's a plot arrangement, Faulkner uses a mythical narrator without a true identification to tell the ghost story of Emily by shifting from first person to third person. All right, so that unifies the focus of this, and it's the articles were both about um, the point of view, which is the narrator. Okay, and, and adds that idea of being a ghost. So that's a good intro with a good thesis. Okay, here's our first paragraph. Now this one took not the summary summary uh, option. This took the three points with support. Now this first point is primarily supported by uh, an article written by Michael Burdock. They did incorporate a little bit of text textual support but I'm really not looking for that here. The absence of gender is the first aspect regarding the mythical narrator. So the idea of is it a he or a she? So that's explained here, right? There's much debate over whether or not the narrator is male or female. However, there are cases where both could be true. And then they go into what uh, the uh, article said. So this is your sort of traditional take a point, support it with your own thoughts, and support those with uh, what you found in the article. So that's that's one approach there. And it's the harder probably of the two, but you see that the um, you see the attribution, Burdick concludes, Burdick also proves, so makes it real clear whose ideas are whose. One thing that makes the story even more mysterious is the fact that Faulkner labels his story ghost story. Now, how do we know that? Because Thomas Klein wrote an article that said he did. Um, and there's the attribution in blue, and you see that there is part paraphrasing and selective quoting in a page number. Um, referring to page numbers. When we use our databases, some of them have page numbers good and some don't. If you used uh, the Gale Literature Resource Center, uh, it could be that it was HTML and you just, when you print it out, there aren't any page numbers. In that case, use the page number of your printout. If you didn't print it out, I will accept the absence of a page number. If there isn't one, if it's a short article, you should say the paragraph number. If you got it off of like Academic Search Premier, they usually have a PDF option and sometimes they have it in Gale documents. Um, the PDF will have the real page number as it was in print originally, and that is what we would always want, and that's preferable. But like I said, um, even through a database, sometimes they give you an HTML and it doesn't have one. So, uh, but make sure it's really clear, you know, where it begins and where it ends, which is super easy if you have an author and you have a page number. And then this leads on to some other discussion. You can see this one was a little over a thousand words, but actually that would in, that includes the works cited, so it's not actually <clears throat> a thousand words for the essay. Last point: Faulkner's unique way of telling the story of a rose for Emily through nonlinear structure and his shift of point of view really leaves the reader with many questions. And this was emphasized by the Klein article. They could have used both, but this, you know, that's how it laid out. And then there's a nice lengthy conclusion here where they kind of reflect on what they got from that information, what they thought about it. I believe they've taken the context to a whole new, you know, extreme. I completely agree. They make sense. It's interesting to see. It helps me understand, uh, you know, it better kind of thing. Uh, and here's your works cited page. All right, let me just show you this right here. See that? 90, that's 90 words. So that means this word count is actually just a hair over a thousand words. So remember, this part does not count in the word count. But it's formatted correctly. Works cited is the title, it's centered. Then your citations are here on the left margin. Now that's just blown up because of the uh, notations. Okay, and we're about out of time. But they're hanging and dented in double space like you should know how to do. But notice that you've got the story citation, you have the articles, and the way they're ordered is according to this word right here, okay, which is the words that show up in the paper to, to let me know which source it came from. And it's alphabetized. Burdock, 
Faulkner Klein. That's the rule. You alphabetize it according to that author's last name. And then you notice if I say your citation was incomplete because if it came from the database it's going to say that. Um, it's going to say where it originally was published right like explicator or the studies in English and it's going to have which database you found it in. All right, so I will make that that draft available for you to look at, um, but follow the instructions that you were given. And